What's up guys, Dylan, ma one from Mastiff Outdoors here. I'm gonna do a quick overview of my M9 video. Depending on how it does, maybe we'll do some more in-depth claps uh, for each individual compartment and that sort of deal. Um, this is really just to condense it. So we're gonna start off with the TSSI M9A bag in Coyote Brown. Uh, this is my third or fourth TSSI bag. I love them, I really like the design. I've just had them in different colors and different uh, Varying wear basically, so this is like a brand new one, super nice, really dig it. Got it set up for what I use it for. Obviously, you know, you gotta find what you plan on using it for, what you're comfortable using, your level of training. This is all stuff that has to be taken into consideration when you're making an aid bag. Uh, obviously, if it's something super basic, you might just have a glorified band-aid backpack, but if you're like a freaking trauma surgeon rolling out, you know, uh, on some Andrew Fisher type shit, uh, you're gonna have all kinds of stuff in here. So on the outside of the pack itself, I do have a set of uh, trauma shears on a leather or a uh, North American Rescue uh, shear leash, just so you don't lose them. Uh, I find that's a pretty good place to keep them. Obviously, I usually have my Raptors on me as well when we're in the field, but this is just a nice little backup. Um, it's not always you as the medic that's gonna be using the bag. So that's something you have to take into consideration. Uh, following the March algorithm on the outside, we have four cat tourniquets in these tourniquet pouches. These are all Gen 7 cat tourniquets, all staged and ready to go. So, something that's super easily accessible, very, uh, it keeps them protected and out of the elements, but it's, uh, it's super easy, easily accessible for yourself and others. And uh, I definitely dig carrying them like that. It saves a lot of space on the inside as well as the ease of access. Uh, just a reversible med patch here. Uh, flip it over real quick. I do run the flat um, shoulder straps because I typically wear this with body armor. Uh, and these nice flat webbing straps uh, don't tend to shift as much as the padded ones. If you're going to wear it on its own as a backpack, I think the padded ones are a great option. But uh, otherwise, I think these flat ones are definitely the way to go. There's a mesh pocket here that a lot of people I've seen put, you know, their SAM splints or C collars and that sort of deal in there. I just keep a big trauma sheet for... Uh, uh, hemorrhaging as well. It's a, definitely that sort of deal. Uh, it's a good way to keep it there. There's really no other room for it. So uh, that's what I use that for. And we flip it over and go to the outside pocket here. So uh, I used to actually keep all my trauma stuff in here. All the massive hemorrhaging stuff used to be in the bottom where it was kind of all consolidated and easily accessible. I dug that for sure, but uh, due to space and just, you know, kind of reconfiguring the bag, I think this works a little bit better. So on the inside here, I have a Eagle Industries uh, 9x3x5. It's just like a general purpose pouch. Uh, on the inside, it is all diagnostic stuff. I do have a small uh, pulse oximeter, a headlamp that just kind of like a cheapo headlamp I got for uh, EMS week this year, actually. Um, a TCCC card, uh, thermometer, pupil gauge, a stethoscope, a bunch of gloves, and a blood pressure cuff. So like I said, mostly diagnostics. Um, that is the ADC stethoscope. I think it's a pretty good option. Uh, I don't like bringing my litman in the field. I usually just keep it in my work bag. Um, also in there, we have a pocket BVM, the micro cyclone BVM. It's not in the case. It saves a little bit of space this way. And it, I mean, it still it stays nice and clean and stuff. Not that it necessarily has to be, but uh, keeps it out of the elements there. Um, so all my other airway stuff is actually in the inside, but this pouch is accessible through the inside. So if I do have to reach it in a pinch, I can grab it through there. And then it's very easily accessible through this as well. So uh, the pocket BBM is definitely way better than carrying a standard BBM. Don't won't really fit in your med bag. So uh, they're great. I took it out of the case, like I said, just to save a little bit more space. And then also in there is a SAM splint, which is one of the things that you're probably more likely to use than anything else when you're using these things for uh, training in the mountains and whatnot, which is what I use it for. So um, I do like to have the SAM splint because you know a, a broken arm or leg is probably one of your more likely injuries that you'll have to treat. So moving into the bag, the whole thing clamshells open and makes it super really easily accessible where you're not having to dig through it. And that is probably one of my favorite things about the design of this bag, as well as the low profile. It's not really big like the Blackhawk Stomp or uh, any even the North American Rescue Aid uh, 4 bag is a little big. Uh, this definitely makes you strip down to what you really need. And then, of course, you know, if you're running medic, uh, you probably have medic gear throughout the rest of your kit, and this is just supplementing it. So on the top half here in the lid, I do have a uh, number four King LT Superglottic Airway. So um, 
And this is kind of a last ditch. The number four, the only reason I carry, the reason I only carry one of them is uh, because it's kind of a last uh, last ditch. I've run cores at work with uh, just an MPA or just an OPA, and they're more than adequate airways most of the time. The King is just a little bit more advanced. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, super glottic as you've stepped before innovation. Uh, I don't carry an innovation kit. It's something that uh, is kind of debated right now, whether innovations in the field are really uh, something that people should be doing. Uh, and by in the field, I mean in like the woods um, or in hot areas. So it, it's just one of those things um, that I don't really plan on using very much. Obviously you shouldn't really, you know, hopefully don't have to use any of this stuff. But uh, the King tube is just something that I do have just in case. Like I said, the number four is the size that will fit most of the guys that I run with. Uh, this is the NAR version that has the syringe and the lube um, ready to go. Kind of keeps it as compact as you can. In terms of ease of use, I think the eye gel is a lot easier and faster to use, but they're just like not packable at all. So uh, I think this is better than a, than a LMA. Um, so I definitely prefer the King if we're talking super glottics uh, instead of the eye gel for packability. Uh, and it's, it's definitely a more secure airway than one of these. Uh, then I also have uh, another EMS week goodie, just a, a little CPR mask, something light, easy to throw in there. Uh, some of the stuff on the instrument panel isn't directly um, airway related, um, and I'll go through that stuff real quick. We just have a Velcro reusable IV tourniquet, it's a little more robust. I do have some of the uh, small shitty ones in my IV kits. Uh, we do have a scalpel here for general cutting, it's just a good sharp instrument. Um, I don't really have the stuff to do a crike in this bag. Um, but I mean, it could be used for that if you did have the stuff, but <clears throat> I actually just have the scalpel for generalized cutting, uh, a Sharpie here, just so you don't lose it. A little bit of derma bond for minor cuts and stuff like that. Some hemostats. Uh, I think there are a little bit more, there's more uses for hemostats as opposed to just tweezers. If you're going to be using them to remove bars and splinters and that sort of deal. So that's why I rock with the hemostats instead of just regular tweezers. Um, and they lock as well. Of course you can use them for their intended purpose as well. Uh, these are just nose clamps for epistaxis, uncontrolled nosebleeds. Um, it's something that can happen with the pressure change and altitude, working your ass off all day in the woods. Uh, and it's just a hassle, you know, if you tilt your head back, the blood makes you puke because of the stomach irritant, um, and it makes a mess. So definitely pr uh, prefer to have some way to manage that. And they're real small and easy to pack, so it's just something that can, that can come in handy. Uh, 14 gauge NCDs uh, for uh, tension pneumothorax or a hemothorax. Uh, the 10 gauges are better for a hemothorax, so I am looking into getting some uh, 10 gauge NCDs. Uh, but the 14 gauges do work, um, definitely work for both. Uh, so yeah, they are not the ARS version. I have some ARS ones in my other uh, areas of my kit, but these, uh, these different brand ones here fit a little bit better uh, in the instrument panel. OPAs, now I'm not a big OPA fan. I've run cores of work with just an MPA before. Uh, the issue with the OPAs is that when somebody, you know, obviously they're indicated in, in somebody who's unconscious with no gag reflex, uh, but when if somebody can start coming around and regaining the gag reflex, you know, it happens all the time with endotracheal tubes and SGAs where they start bucking the tube. The issue is they'll bite the OPA. The OPA is this brittle plastic, it fucking breaks, and then you end up with an airway obstruction. So that's why I'm not a big uh, OPA guy. Uh, once again, it's a size four OPA, which fits most of the guys on my team. Um, they do have their place, uh, you know, obviously it's, it, it's got its place. Some of the, the issue that I said with them breaking can be solved by having the silicone one. Uh, maybe I'll move to that in the future, but <clears throat> not a big OPA fan. I do have one there and I also keep one on my belt. So moving past that, the airways I do actually really like are nasopharyngeal airways. Uh, these are a different brand, not those typical Roosh ones. They're uh, MedStorm. They're a little bit more robust. They don't uh, deform as easily as the Roosh ones. They start to, the Roosh ones start to crimp off and then it kind of defeats the purpose. So I really like these. Uh, 26, 28, 30 French, the sizes that I use the most at work, also the sizes that fit the guys that I roll with. Um, so I really like the MPAs. I do keep them in their packaging. There's nothing wrong with keeping them out of the packaging because they're not technically sterile, they're just aseptic. So uh, definitely can uh, store them different ways if you like, but I keep them in the packaging flat and with my occlusive dressings, which are hyphen vents, uh, twin packs. I have four here uh, to supplement the rest of the stuff in my kit. I think hyphens are pretty much the gold standard. Um, the vents are nice and big, so they don't occlude like the Ashermans or Bolens. Um, the vented halos are pretty good as well, but I definitely am a hyphen guy. They're also what we use at work, uh, so I dig them. H&H uh, &H wound seal kit, just another option for occlusive dressing. Moving past that, two things of surgical lube. Uh, it's not completely necessary. You can always use saliva or blood 
to lubricate an MPA, um, but it's just options. So moving down from that, uh, back to the March algorithm, we got our airway and respirations, uh, massive hemorrhage. We'll get more into the hemorrhage stuff. So in my massive hemorrhage pouch, I do keep things, uh, two things of quick clot here, uh, hemostatic agent. These are the impregnated gauze, not the powder kind, uh, which is no longer recommended. Um, so those are great to start your wound packing. If you're packing a junctional wound, um, combat gauze is great. You start packing that with that and then you move to the regular compress gauze. Speaking of which, here's my NAR compress gauze. So I keep two of these. Pretty self-explanatory, it's just compressed gauze, vacuum sealed to save space. So you usually start your packing with the hemostatic, move to this, and then secure it with an ETD. So these are North American Rescue ETDs, emergency trauma dressings. Uh, they also have the Israeli brand ones um, that are a little bit different with the clip. I keep some of those on my belt, um, but I, inside the bag I have these. Um, so I really like, I actually prefer the North American Rescue. I like the Velcro makes it easier and faster to apply. So uh, they're basically just an ace bandage with an uh, abdominal pad sewn on it, but it's a great way to keep pressure on a dress or on a wound once you've packed it. Um, so I'm definitely a big fan of those. Moving past that, we do have two rolls of Curlix. Curlix are two of the things in the EMS world that are some of the things in the EMS world that are most applicable for different situations. You can use them for almost anything. You can use them to uh, secure a splint to a damn or a broken arm or something like that, um, which I do have the SAM splint. Like I said, you can make a makeshift swath or sling out of it. I also do carry uh, triangle bandages, but we'll get there for that. So you can also, uh, it isn't as tightly knit as the compress gauze, but you can pack a wound with these in a pinch. You can use them to secure things. Uh, you can use them to uh, cover eyes if uh, you have an eye injury or control scalp bleeds. So uh, Curlix is definitely something that's not quite as uh, packable. They do squeeze down a little bit, but uh, I think it's worth carrying for the space. And then there's a regular abdominal pad. Um, I'm not sure the dimensions on that one, but it's one of the bigger ones. Uh, it's just a big piece of gauze. Uh, as the name would imply, use it for abdominal wounds, eviscerations. You wet them a little bit to uh, keep everything inside there uh, and then tape it down. But you can also use them, I use them for burns at work, uh, just wetting them depending on how uh, severe the burns are. So. That's basically everything I carry for massive hemorrhaging other than my uh, trauma sheet, like I said, and then uh, the tourniquets. So moving past hemorrhage, airway respirations, we're going to circulation. So for circulation is going to be intravenous and intraosseous access. So on my kit, I have pre-made IV kits that have everything ready to go in them. This is more to supplement that, which is why I have just a Ziploc bag with buff caps, tegaderms, and uh, prep pads to secure and clean your IV sites, and then 16, 18, 20 gauge IV catheters. Obviously we're not really going smaller than that. My demographic are all young, healthy guys with uh, great veins, so there's really no need in putting a 22 or a 24 in somebody. Smallest all usually goes a 20. And then we have uh, two normal saline flushes to ensure patency of your lines. So uh, like I said, it's not pre-assembled into kits uh, in this. Then a little piece of uh, cohesive bandage coban with a little transport tape in there. Also have uh, paper tape and another thing of transport tape just kind of outside to secure other things. This is a uh, easy IO uh, manual IO kit with the blue needle, uh, which is one of the mo more common adult sizes. This is not for sternum. This is not a fast one or anything like this. This would be more for a tibial IO. Uh, obviously it's kind of an emergency vascular access if you can't uh, get a regular IV you can move to an IO. IVs are almost always preferable because you can push stuff uh, different fluids and different medications through them faster than in an IO but uh, IOs are definitely great and they have their place so I do keep uh, one of those in the bag and there's also one on my belt. Moving from there we have uh, <clears throat> fluid so this is a Skedco uh, fluid bag hanger and it's got a uh, pouch that kind of keeps it all safe, keeps it secure. It's also uh, kind of like, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's got like neoprene in there, so it's kind of insulated. Keep the temperature of the bag, whether you want it cooler or warmer. Uh, it's got a little clip here to hang. Uh, I definitely like this. It's got a hole for the bottom for the pigtail and stuff and a little window so you can see how much fluid you're inf infusing. So this is just a bag of normal saline. Um, and then it also has a little pocket here that I keep a macro drip set in. So bag of normal saline. So obviously we're uh, not using crystalloid fluids in uh, trauma. Hemorrhagic shock, it doesn't properly perfuse the tissues 
because of the lack of oxygen carrying capacity of crystalloid fluid. It's just going to cause hemodilution. Uh, filling up the tank, the old school way of bilateral 18s, wide open fluid bolus is definitely out uh, in terms of evidence-based medicine. Uh, we're definitely not using crystalloid fluids and trauma like that anymore because uh, it causes more issues than it fixes. Uh, getting a better number on your monitor is not worth killing the patient. So uh, we're definitely limiting fluid and trauma. I don't have access to blood products. Some people do. If you do, you know, take advantage of that. Your transfusion kits, blood boxes are definitely good options. Um, I see a lot of tac tactical medics, combat medics, SWAT medics moving away from carrying like any crystalloid fluid. The big reason that I do still carry large boluses of lactated ringers and normal saline is more for rehydration, heat cast situations during training, not so much for, uh, for the trauma or hemorrhagic shock itself. Obviously, you know, permissive hypotension and rapid transport are what you need for that. But uh, for my purposes, I do have all my guys carry, uh, in addition to their IFAC, they all carry a small IV start kit with a bag of fluid um, for rehydration purposes when we're training, when we're in uh, dry environments, uh, obviously high altitude. So um, it's definitely something that, uh, that I, I like to keep for, for rehydration and heat cas, not necessarily for trauma. Um, so that's basically it for the IV circulation stuff. Moving on, this is more of a miscellaneous pouch. It's got some more minor stuff in it. A band-aid kit you know as a medic it's kind of embarrassing when you have this badass trauma bag and somebody asks you for a band-aid and you don't have it you gotta like improvise something with all your cool shit so just keep a little pack of band-aids on me as well as smaller pieces of gauze you might be wondering why these aren't in the hemorrhaging thing because you don't pack wounds with two by two and uh, four by four these are more for discontinuing ivs or uh, securing a, a missed iv site a failed iv site and small scrapes and bruises Moving past that for uh, hypothermia prevention, if we're talking the March algorithm still, nothing super crazy. I don't have one of those big active warming blankets, but I do have a space blanket and uh, some uh, super warmers, which are basically just big hot hands. I need to replenish that a little bit too. A couple of these have been used. So uh, that's what I have just to help keep somebody warm. Um, something that happens in the mountains for sure. So moleskin padding, something that every medic should have as well. Your feet are gonna get torn up when you're rucking and training all day. Uh, these two things are actually more medications, but they don't fit in my med box, so they're in here. This is transdermal lidocaine patches for uh, some basic pain relief, as well as some oral glucose for diabetic emergencies. Not that anybody I roll with is diabetic, but it doesn't really hurt to have. I might move to the chewable tablets, though, uh, you know, because obviously if somebody can uh, do oral glucose, they can probably chew uh, the tablets. So cold pack uh, can be used for act some cooling if somebody's, you know, heat casting, uh, depending on how far along they are, you can use that with the pulse points uh, to bring their core temperature down. You can also uh, put that with your fluid to bring the temperature of the fluid down and just cool them uh, kind of passively as it goes. Um, obviously, if somebody's too far along into into um, into their heat cast situation there, that's not going to be what you want to do. You're going to want to sweat for them with water. Anyways, I don't need to give a class on heat cast. Uh, here we have a Fox shield. I usually have two of them. I need to find the other one, but that's for eye injuries from a burn or blast. Uh, obviously if you have penetrating eye trauma, you want to secure it with one of these and uh, just transport in place. Then we have triangle bandages for slinging and swathing of the uh, SAM splint for the most part, but triangle bandages can be used for uh, bleeding. You can turn them into like face masks or uh, uh, bandana as well. They're very multi-purpose. Definitely doesn't hurt to carry them. Then, uh, I have a ACE bandage just for uh, strains and sprains. It can also be used as an ETB basically in a print in a pinch. So uh, it's not really what I have it for, but I know some people keep them in their bleeders. Uh, moving on, we do have a drug box. Uh, there's nothing serious in here. There's nothing, no narcs or anything like hard hitting um, drugs in there. It's just basically OTC stuff, smaller stuff. Um, so it's all stuff that's pretty readily available. No narcs, no controlled substances, nothing crazy. So we do have, uh, I'm in the process of repackaging some PO medications. Um, and when I get that done, I'm gonna have some aspirin uh, as well as some uh, ibuprofen and stomach relief like Pepto-Bismol, that sort of deal, uh, as well as some PO Zofran. Uh, so I'm working on that, but right now uh, I don't have that, which is why there's some empty spaces. So I'm, I'm working on repackaging my PO meds. Right now, pretty much everything in here is intravenous. So we got some Zofrans for uh, long, uh, 
long rides up into the mountains to go train and stuff like that can make you car sick so it's it's there and i also like i said we'll have the po's over in some uh neosporin packets basically just for uh, cleaning out wounds before you put a, a band-aid on for something minor do have two vials of uh, lidocaine um since i do carry the io kits uh so then also naloxone this is a full dose because these are two milligrams a piece so it's a full dose of uh, naloxone narcan for opioid overdoses as well as the uh, atomizer and the little uh, bullet that they go in uh, they make the like push kind that you can get at walgreens this is more the ems style i don't carry narcs so that's not necessarily you know why i carry would like obviously if you carry narcs you should have narcan as well but uh this is more just like an in case situation i don't really roll around with this bag but if i happen to have it and rolled up on a suspected opioid overdose you no know, i guess it's there and then these are all administration. So I have two uh, 23 gauge or 25 gauge 3cc syringes. Mostly, I don't really have any medications that should be given, uh, would be more efficacious intramuscularly. So these are more just for drawing up the vials of uh, IV uh, medication. And then uh, just another fill needle and another syringe, uh, just for drawing up meds basically. But that's basically my med box. It's nothing super crazy. It's just uh, basic meds, just for uh, ailments in the field. That's pretty much everything I carry in my bag, you know? So I hope this has been helpful for you. If you're looking for a different way to set things up, I do like to think that uh, my bag's a little bit different than a lot of the kind of more cookie cutter ones I've seen on YouTube. So if you can help you out with uh, setting up your med bag, like you said, you know, just use what you're comfortable with and what you're uh, approved to use and uh, stay safe out there, you know? So thanks for sticking through. I know it was a long video with a lot to cover. Uh, we'll do a part two on the March bell and maybe we'll break down some of this stuff individually, but. Take it easy. Thanks for watching. Rate, comment, subscribe.